गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी माई सेल्फ आई एम गोपीनाथ कुलकर्णी फ्रॉम फाइजर लिमिटेड बेस्ड एट मुंबई एंड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई लाइक टू वेलकम ऑल द हंड्रेड ऑफ अटेंडीज हुए जॉइन इन दिस वेबिनार ऑन ए संडे मॉर्निंग सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल सिंसियर थैंक्स टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड I just like to say that you won't be disappointed because the topic and the faculty of the day is such that you will find it very useful and uh, uh, absolutely revealing in many aspects uh, as such. Uh, just to give a background on the kind of webinar, especially on bird defects, uh, I'd like to say that a couple of years back when we actually came in touch with the uh, Spina Bifida Foundation and Dr. Karmarkar, we realized the extent of uh, uh, preventable bird defects. Uh, which are not taking place in the country and that led to this association with uh, uh, the spina bifida foundation and we have made it a mission to uh, make clear uh, create as much awareness as possible on this particular subject uh, so that is one of the key reasons why we are having this webinar today and just to let you know that we have partnered with the spina bifida foundation to have this uh, webinars across the country uh, to spread this message across now uh, i won't go much into detail but i'll hand it over to uh the coordinator for this program and uh, i'd just like to introduce to you dr i'd like to introduce to you dr tisimi who is going to be the coordinator for uh, today's uh, session and dr tisimi is a consultant neurosurgeon and uh, at the apollo children's hospital in chennai she is md and dnb in neurosurgery uh, she has a tremendous interest in this subject and she has a lot of international publications and scholarships to her credit including neurosurgery focus in 2019 and the world neurosurgery in uh, 2019 uh, she was awarded the prestigious epstein uh, scholarship by the international society of pediatric neurosurgery in 2018 Uh, she has uh, doing a lot of research and her ongoing research publications include pediatric uh, hydrocephalus neuroendoscopic management of the hydrocephalus and uh, mild traumatic brain injury in pediatrics neuro practice as well as she is a co-author of chapter of uh, cranio synostosis in textbook of the contemporary neurosurgery by dr vincent tamburaj uh, she is an active member of the neurological society of india the indian society of pediatric neurosurgery the international society of pediatric neurosurgery as well as she is a, a member of the core committee of the spina bifida foundation of the tamil nadu chapter uh, uh, 2020 so she will be the one coordinating this program uh, but before handing over i would also like to introduce the uh, dr prakash agarwal uh, uh, mch professor and current head of department of pediatric surgery at the sri ramchandra institute uh, university and consultant pediatric surgeon at apollo children's hospital in chennai uh he was actually uh, when he came to bombay and he started his mch and uh, his interest uh, in laparoscopic surgery started off in fact he is associated with setting up the first laparoscopic surgical unit in a pediatric teaching institute and his passion for this uh, uh, went to an extent where from mumbai he went to work with world leaders like dr uh, professor hand and at adelaide and also to new zealand at the starship children hospital uh, and pursue his passion for the pediatric uh, laparoscopic surgery Uh, presently like i said he is working as the professor and head of pediatric surgery at the prestigious uh, shri shamchandra medical college uh, and a consulting pediatric surgeon also at the apollo hospital chennai uh, he, over the last 20 years he has been associated with more than 10000 laparoscopic cases in children and he has established himself as a uh, leading pediatric laparoscopic surgeon in the national arena and he is also the executive member of the pediatric endosurgeons group of india and he is very active both in the psi as well as the iaps which is the indian association of pediatric surgeon and he has himself organized many national and international workshops and especially the second psi meeting organized at srmc was a runaway success he is very prolific in terms of publications more than 45 national and international publications and with five books published to his credit and is a co-author of the popular atlas on the laparoscopic pediatric surgery and is also the co-editor of IAPS textbook of pediatric surgery and you can find more details of him on his web page which is uh, www.pediatriclaparoscopy.in uh, an avid proponent of laparoscopic surgery in children he has presented his work in national and international arena for the last uh, 20 years and uh, the background itself speaks of the kind of uh, uh, interaction that we are going to have in this uh, webinar as such so now i'll 
uh, hand over the uh, proceedings to Dr. Prakash Agarwal. So, welcome Dr. Prakash and Dr. Tisini and I'll hand it over to Dr. Uh, Prakash. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this uh, Sunday morning when we have arranged this meeting of the Spina Bifida Foundation of the Tamil Nadu chapter. This was a long awaited uh, meeting we were supposed to do uh, two months back, but because of some constraints, we had to hold it back. But anyway, better late than never. So we are here today morning to have a whole session of uh, discussion on congenital defects in uh, congenital malformations. So we have a host of speakers, Dr. Nirmala Jaisankar, who is a leading uh, optician in the city of Chennai. Then we have Dr. Santosh Karmarkar from Mumbai, and then Dr. Suresh from Mediscan, who everybody must be knowing. So we will be discussing today all about congenital malformations and their uh, treatment and uh, how these defects are. Uh, having the effect on all the population all over the world. So straight away, I would like to start them. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Nirmala Jaishankar, who will be taking up the first talk on uh, congenital malformations in children. So we'll uh, go to the slide of Dr. Nirmala Jaishankar. Can see the slides, sir? No, I am not able to see. Can I share my slides? Ah, yeah. Can you just look at? So, the, our first speaker will be Dr. Nirmala Jaishankar, who is a senior consultant gynecologist and obstetrician. In the city of Chennai at the Apollo First Med and Apollo Cradle Hospital. She was uh, the university rank holder in MD Optics in Guyana and was awarded six gold medals from the Madras University. After first Tamil Nadu Medical Service, she went to London, worked at the prestigious King's College at London. Then she obtained her MRCOG and FRCOG from there. She was awarded the best Do doctor's award from the Dr. MGR Medical University, Tamil Nadu, in the year 2010. She was the president of OXI for the year 2015-2016. She was a very active member of the TNRCOG, and her fields of interest are in high-risk pregnancy, endoscopic surgery, she likes to teach the postgraduates, and she is a very prolific traveler, with her being in music and movies. So I hand over to Dr. Nirmala Jaisankar to carry on her next speech on tendon malformation. Thank okay. you, Dr. Pekka Shagadwan, for the kind introduction. Shall I share my slides? Yes. Yeah. How can I share? Go here. Um, my slides are visible, Suresh? No. And off? No, no, no. Not, not yet, not yet. Not yet? Not, not yet, I'm not. Okay, slides are not visible. Not yet. Just put share and then... No, no. Did it, you know? I mean, I can see it. But... No, no, no. You have to go to the share. Ah. And through that, you should be able to see it. One I think it's the uh, net, net connectivity problem. I don't know. No, no, net connectivity is all right because we are seeing her video, right? So she's uh, fine. Go, go to the bottom of the screen and you'll see a share. Click on that. Just one minute. Dr. Karmakar, what you told me no, is no, right. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you go, go. You reduce the PowerPoint presentation. You because the PowerPoint is occupying, occupying the full screen. Yeah, you. May not see our screen. So you do Alt Tab, Alt Tab. Then you go to our video. You must see all our videos first. Are you seeing all our videos first? Yes. Now you go to Share. The bottom you can see Share. Yeah, I can. Uh, press that now. Okay. Then. 
then you will see the PowerPoint inside that. Once you say share, uh -huh. you will see uh, the some square boxes coming with the PowerPoint. One of them will have the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just press that. Yes. Now click on PowerPoint. Can you see his race? Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Go to the first slide and start. Yeah. Okay. This is the second slide, I think. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Morning, everyone. Greetings from Chennai. Um, thank you, Spina Bifida Foundation and Dr. Prakash Agarwal and Dr. Suresh for this opportunity. And uh, I would also like to thank Pfizer for the technical support. I know the problem that I had yesterday and uh, maybe a little bit this morning. Okay, as a primary care physician and as an obstetrician, what is my view on birth defect? Okay, so when a couple come to me, when a young couple come to me, they want to go home with a happy baby and they want to enjoy the joy of parenting. And anything less than that, it causes a lot of distress for the entire couple. And leave alone correctable anomalies like cleft lip. Supposing you have an incorrectable anomaly which will cause a lot of um, developmental delay, mental retardation like microcephaly, then that causes a lot of distress to the entire family. So just to define birth defect, we can define them as any structural defect or a functional anomaly which will include inborn errors of metabolism that occur during the intrauterine life. Some of them can be identified prenatally by your all your armamentarium of diagnosis, majority at birth, but some little later in life. And when all the other causes of perinatal death like asphyxia, infection and prematurity are going to be controlled, then birth defect will emerge as a major cause of newborn or perinatal deaths. And as I told you, it causes a lot of distress to the young couple, to the family, to the society and healthcare system, you know, as a whole. Now, we need some statistics to understand the magnitude of the problem. And according to WHO, globally, birth defects are responsible for 2,72,000 perinatal deaths. And what is the good news is 70% of the birth defects are preventable, but you need to apply cost-effective community-based genetic services because certain kind of birth defects are very common in certain communities and it has to be need-based approach in order to achieve a reduction in the birth defect. And again, to give you some statistics, worldwide, we are having 79 lakh births with some serious birth defect. And 94% of them will occur in middle and low income groups and not only the perinatal death, they are responsible for infant mortality and also under five deaths. What about India? The prevalence of the birth defect could vary from six to seven, which will translate to 17 lakhs babies born annually with birth defects, not, you know, with varying degrees of disability. Okay? So, when a couple comes to a with the index baby having had a birth defect. Whatever we do, in nearly 50% of the cases, the exact cause cannot be identified. It could be caused by a single gene defect, chromosomal disorder, it can have a multifactorial inheritance, and don't forget environmental teratogens, and we have not forgotten the thalidomide tragedy. When you look at the common birth defects in India, it could vary from congenital heart disease, congenital deafness. Congenital heart disease, we know that even if it is done by an expert sonologist, some of them can be missed. 
congenital deafness and neural cubal defect is a success story wherein when we give periconceptional folic acid we are able to at least eradicate 70% of the neural cubal defect so as i told you some of the birth defects are clinically apparent like say a spina bifida or a meningomyelocele or a cleft lip and a palate at birth whereas some of them can be diagnosed only later in life so with this as an introduction me as an obstetrician who will be the primary care physician for the patient what is a role my role as an obstetrician in order to decrease the birth defect so the first and foremost i want to impress upon the preconceptional counseling you know supposing the lady has any medical disorder she should feel free to come to the obstetrician make sure that she is in an optimal health as far as her health as far as her medical condition is concerned before she plans a pregnancy and post conception care so we all know that open neural tubal defect can be prevented by folic acid supplementation but what happens in reality is that the lady misses a period she does a urine pregnancy test done and she gets two lines and confirms pregnancy but she doesn't visit the obstetrician till she completes two months so what we need to impress upon the couple is that the neural tube closes by 28 days after conception so she ovulates and within a month that is the crucial time when the lady has to have adequate folic acid and our cultural habit is that the elders at home tell the lady it's okay if you go only after you complete two weeks so i as an obstetrician i need to impress upon the patient that all women who are eligible to get pregnant should take mm. folic acid supplementation every day and government can also um, intervene and then fortification program of staple food such as wheat flour uh, could also be done in india it's not only folic acid it's vitamin b12 which is also important to prevent a neural tubal defect and uh, many of us we give a supplementation of both folic acid and vitamin b12 to women who are planning a pregnancy so even when a lady comes to you with the infertility or with some other um, you know problem like irregular periods you need to impress upon her that the folic acid has to be taken before conception and we should not miss the first one month of pregnancy and that has to be impressed upon now as i told you as an obstetrician we need to give them optimal preconceptional care whenever there is a medical disorder complicating pregnancy and topping the list is diabetes obesity diabetes pre diabetic they are becoming very common and just in the last week alone i had two young women one lady just booked thankfully very early at 5 weeks and a routine sugar showed 375 and we were not sure whether the lab made an error so when we rechecked and did her hemoglobin a1c it was 10.2 the lady didn't even know that she was a diabetic and because of many family and social reasons the lady was not willing for a termination she needed to be hospitalized and she needed something like 70 to 100 units of penicillin to get her sugars under control and to educate her so that is very important obesity pre diabetic and diabetic optimal control before pregnancy as an obstetrician i need to impress upon the patient coming to epilepsy epilepsy has got a social stigma and a taboo and many a times the lady does not reveal that she has threats to the uh, to the husband and her family and she completely stops the medication and we know that certain anti epileptic drugs are you know pregnancy friendly and certain of them are not so it's very important that you get the lady to change over to an anti epileptic which is safe for the baby at the same time gives a good uh, control regarding her epileptic fits 
and then started on preconception and folic acid, she may require maybe a little increased dose of folic acid when she is planning a pregnancy. And another thing is, you know, ever so often, once in three months, we get a couple who are retrovirus positive, who are coming to you regarding preconception and counseling. And it is very important that you take the help of an infective medicine specialist, make sure that her health is optimal, and she is on proper antiviral drugs which are safe in pregnancy before she plans a pregnancy. And also, it's not uncommon nowadays to get many women who have a cardiac prosthesis in place, a metallic band, and who are on heparin, or who are on warfarin, who need to be switched over to heparin. So I cannot emphasize more the importance of preconceptional care whenever there is a medical disorder complicating pregnancy because we want to avoid a diabetic embryopathy. And in one where we can do better is the rubella vaccination. The rubella vaccination is very important. And whenever a lady comes to you for infertility, along with all your other investigations that you do, you check for her rubella immunity. And if her IgG levels are in the non-immune range, you give her a rubella vaccine. Tell her it is very important. Ask her to avoid pregnancy because it's a live vaccine and then to plan a pregnancy after three months. Because, you know, very sad to see a, a young um, girl coming along with her parents who is mentally retarded, having a congenital cataract, cardiac anomaly, because it's one preventable birth defect is the congenital rubella syndrome. And as I was talking to you, we all worry about the warfarin embryopathy because Warfarin, when it is given in a dose more than 5 milligrams, it can interfere with the bone and cartilage formation. But when, as an obstetrician, you are stopping her of warfarin because she needs it so that the metallic valve or the artificial valve does not get thrombosed, you must get the cardiologist involved in the care because the patient needs a therapeutic dose of heparin and not a prophylactic dose of heparin mm -hmm. because you know, we need to be very, very careful about the mother as well as the baby when we are taking care of women who have medical disorders complicating pregnancy. As I told you, I, as a primary care physician, my role is to identify the families at risk of conceiving a child with a birth defect because inherited disorders, they tend to cluster within the families. And the consanguineous marriage is very common in, among certain communities in India and also in certain districts in India. So you should spend that extra time to take a pedigree chart. And when you are worried, you get a genetic involved and give them appropriate preconceptional care. Because, um, and also, when you are doing your routine antenatal investigations, it's a good idea to include Hemoglobin electrophoresis also in order to identify certain thalassemias and sickle cell disorders. Now, having taken through the preconceptional care, I need to impress upon the patient that the antenatal care, the pyramid is inverted now. We used to give a lot more care in the first three to five months of pregnancy, and then maybe you can, you know, space it in. And when we have a lot of COVID cases the whole of last year, we all learned that we could manage the patients with fewer uh, visits to the hospital. But then the antenatal care, the first trimester screening, tell them that 11 to 14 week scan is very important. And also looking at the nuchal translucency and the biochemistry, which will guide us. And very important to tell them that these are only screening tests and they are not diagnostic tests. Because during the COVID time, I know of two couples who had the screening test and the screen was positive and the patient could not, could not get medical access to do a confirmatory test and they were very scared and they went and got their pregnancy terminated. In so much so, we want to prevent the birth defect. 
it is our duty to give the fetus a, a chance. We should not, before we decide to terminate any pregnancy, for whatever reason, we should be very, very careful that we are doing the right thing. And all of you know the detailed anomaly scan or the TIFA scan, which we do between 18 to 20 weeks. And if it is done by a sonologist who does a thorough examination, a lot of defects could be picked up. And then we could offer them appropriate counseling and also offer them fetal echo whenever it is indicated, say a diabetic patient or there is a family history of cardiac anomaly and you need to offer them the fetal echo. And as and when it is necessary, you offer them additional tests in the form of chorion villus sampling, amniocentesis, the non-invasive testing which is the cell-free fetal DNA and cardiocentesis for certain conditions and a comprehensive, what Suresh calls it as a fetal master health checkup. Because every fetus should be given the chance to for a survival. And as much as we want to prevent the birth defect, we should not be um, offering any terminations lightly. We should take appropriate counseling and then only we should do it. And as an obstetrician, my role doesn't end just with delivery. After the delivery, along with my neonatal physician, we should do a thorough physical examination. Why I am in insisting on a thorough physical examination is that many a patients, they come to you for the second pregnancy, having lost the first child during the perinatal period. And we have very scant uh, literature, or very scant notes to go by. Now, all of us have a smartphone. We can actually take a picture. We can do a proper physical examination. All of us can get a fetogram or an x-ray can be done. And in majority of the institutions, newborn screening is offered. And whenever we have a neonate with a birth defect, we need to offer them appropriate medical and surgical reference. Because many as simple structural disorders, they are eminently correctable. Um, you know, with appropriate uh, referral and appropriate uh, surgery or medication. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk saying that as an obstetrician, we call, we are, for any condition, there are three kinds of preventions that are available. Primary prevention, secondary and tertiary. And what we are offering is tertiary and secondary and whether we can offer them primary pre prevention by offering proper family welfare services, maintaining good preconceptional health, promoting healthy lifestyle measures, proper control of preconceptional medical conditions. And one thing where I really want to emphasize is improving the coverage for rubella vaccinations. Avoiding harmful drugs like alcohol, tobacco, or any other drug. And we all heard about the Zika virus pandemic and microcephaly that happened. And also, when we have a family with a cluster of inherited disorders, we need to offer them genetic counseling, carrier screening, and enable the couple to limit the family size. And all our health staffs have to be educated. January is a national birth defect prevention month and the, the slogan for this is best for you is best for the baby and the government is actually uh, giving you five tips. One is folic acid, second is early prenatal visit, updating with all the vaccines, before you get pregnant you try to reach a healthy weight and boost your health by avoiding any harmful substances like alcohol, tobacco, or any other drugs. So with this, I would like to say that there is nine months of preparing to fall in love for a lifetime. And I, as a primary care physician, along with my fetal medicine specialist, under appropriate medical consultation whenever it is necessary, I should try and help the couple to take home a healthy baby and allow them the joy of parenting. would like to thank Spina Bhaitra Foundation for this opportunity. Thank you.
இது எப்படி the sound is very less yeah there are a few questions here so uh, dr ravindra wants to know why there is an apathy among uh, concerned specialists the health ministry apathy shows us etc why b12 deficiency as a cause of ntd is not included in awareness campaign disney can you be little louder better now huh? yeah yeah okay yeah okay so dr ravindra wants to know why the awareness of the uh, importance of b12 in causing ntds is not included in the awareness campaigns by the concerned authorities generally it is folic acid which can prevent about 70% of the neurological defect but in countries like india where the nutritional status of the women play a large role vitamin b12 is also important so combination tablets are available wherein you can combine folic acid and vitamin which will definitely help you to you know increase uh, or in the or decrease the incidence of neurotrophic disease suresh you want to add something yeah yeah so uh, we went through this uh, years ago regarding adding of b12 the main reason why in a national program b12 is not added because of the very very inexpensive and uh, easily given if you take a tablet of folic acid uh, or a tablet of folic acid plus b12 the combination costs much much more so even in the adolescent program uh, the the uh, it's not being included as part of the thing but in india the research has shown that uh, giving b12 along with folic acid definitely helps to reduce Uh, it's more effective than folic acid alone okay thank you thank you ma'am sir there's another question from dr tara uh, she wants to know why medication in the fa- what medication in the father is likely to increase birth defects generally supposing the father has been on any of the chemotherapeutic agents like you know we get the men with non hodgkins lymphoma or any kind of a tumor generally we give a lot of importance to the mother because that is the one which directly affects the fetus but the the medication to the father if it is going to cause an increase in the dna fragmentation of the sperms and then by indirectly it can affect and also the age of the father is related to certain autosomal recessive disorders and also autosomal dominant disorders okay ma'am thank you uh now in the uh, i i would like to ask you about the preconception awareness of uh, the women in india uh, uh do you suggest any measures of uh, to improve the awareness amongst the people about the need for a, g- a good healthy uh, weight um, good diet etc uh, when can we actually catch them which is the best time um Uh, they probably end up coming to you only when uh, they are past the first 8 uh, weeks so is there any way uh, in which we can uh, get them before that maybe like when they were pediatrics uh, the pediatrician itself can counsel them right from birth something like that it's a joke among all the obstetricians saying that whenever you go for a reception of a couple you need to <laughs> add folic acid tablet in the you know okay. i mean basically um what we need to tell them is majority of them comes to you only when they are like 2 months pregnant that mm-hmm. they have already missed the crucial time yes and we get the very kind of patients you know when i practice in a corporate hospital majority of them come to you for a preconceptional counseling and they are very aware of uh, you know the macro and the micronutrients their diet and health whereas we have got a large kind of population where even if you prescribe folic acid they just take it for a month and if it takes a little longer to conceive they stop 
I think it is just talking to them and just counseling, saying that it is one thing which is very, very important. And I always tell them it's not a fertility drug. It is a drug yeah. for the brain development of the baby. And you tell them that not to stop after taking for a month. Because you give it to them. Some of them may take about six months to conceive. And they just take it for two months and then when they come back with pregnancy, you ask them whether they were taking folic acid, then they say, oh, I stopped it after two months. I think it is talking and counseling, which is very important. Okay, ma'am. Now, uh, the high-risk pregnancies, you are obvi obviously much more careful. Now, in case you do detect something abnormal, what is your protocol? How do you go ahead uh, uh, in further managing that pregnancy? Are there some tests that you uh, go by uh, for sure before you decide to tell them? Can we ask Suresh to answer this because Suresh would be a better person to tell. Can you, can you, can you repeat the question for me, please? Yes, sir. Once we uh, detect that there is some uh, something abnormal, now all these screening tests are only screening. They are not 100% uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, how do we go about the next step? Are there certain uh, uh, tests that are mandatory before we confirm and then proceed with the... It's reasonably clear. See, it's reasonably clear. If you are looking at structural defects, okay, uh, de depending on the uh, level of expertise of the operator, uh, there are defects where we can precisely say that, for example, neural tube defect, I can definitely say there's a neural tube defect and more than 90% of neural tube defects will be identified with, with, without much of ambiguity. The problem comes is, are there any associated problems? And sometimes associated problems can be missed. So while we can detect the primary defect, the, uh, the degree of association with others can change, and that may actually have an impact on counseling. We usually counsel with the primary defect, and then at birth they find out one or two more which is there. Uh, the parents must be made to be prepared for that also, surprises at, at birth. And some of them would require additional testing. Uh, I am suspecting, let's say I suspect a cle I have a cleft lip and palate. I would certainly do a karyotype to rule out trisomy 18 or trisomy 13. So this is very important. To get the full extent of it, some of them would require extent, uh, extended examination. Today we do a microarray. Whenever there's uh, more than one system involved, we resort to a chromosomal microarray. Some of them will need uh, 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 exome sequencing or whole exome sequencing also. Okay, sir. So, uh, there are no more questions from the audience. I think we'll move on to the next talk. The next. We have the next talk by Dr. Prakash Agarwal. Yeah, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, you can see. Okay, good morning, everyone. So, as Dr. Nirmala Jaisankar told that uh, she is a primary physician where the patients who have a problem will come to her first. And then we get referred as pediatric surgeons, those cases which are having some abnormality in the antenatal scan. So I will be speaking from the pediatric surgical perspective of how we take care of these patients. And when we get these patients, how do we tackle them? But I will be talking about other anomalies apart from neural tube defects because Dr. Karmarkar is going to speak on neural tube defects. So as she already told about the congenital anomalies, the scale of the problem, I am not going to repeat the same. But what I want to highlight is what we think compared to that, the number of anomalies are much, much, much more. When I found out that there are more than 141 congenital anomalies and still there are some surgical anomalies which have not been enumerated in that. So, if you see the number of anomalies, they are really mammoth compared to what we think in our day-to-day -day life and practice. So, what has happened that over a period of time, the years has passed, 
hospital diagnosis and therapy has expanded. So have pediatric surgeons have increasingly got involved in the management of surgical anomalies before and after birth. Before because now fetal therapy has come into work. And now after birth is our main role where we as pediatric surgeons come into the picture and try to do some of the problems which are there in the children and try to rectify them. So those advances has led to improved perinatal and postnatal care. And most of the correctly defects are best managed by optimizing the location. Optimizing the location, I mean delivering in a tertiary care hospital where all the problems can be taken care of for the mother, for the child, and after the birth, we should have a good NICU. The mode and timing of delivery should be properly planned so that we deliver in a proper setup where all the problems can be handled. And the postnatal care of the infant can be taken care of, uh, so that we will have a tertiary care NICU, which is a level 3 NICU. We should remember that in spite of so many structural defects, most of the congenital anomalies can be corrected by pediatric surgeons. And if the early treatment is administered correctly on time, most of them can be corrected. So it is important that the pediatric surgeon who is handling the problem should be familiar with the management of these lesions at birth and be involved in the management of the family counseling. So when we have a counseling session with the obstetrician, with the somatologist, with the pediatric surgeon, neonatologist, we form an important part because most of the parents will have a query, what will happen to the child after birth? Though they are in a shock that the child has got an anomaly, so they would like to know whether it's a correctable anomaly or we have to do something more or they have to have a termination. So that is where the role of the pediatric surgeon comes into picture where they can assure the parents no, no, this baby can be corrected so that we give them a ray of hope. Now coming to all the common defects, which are the most common congenital defects are the heart defects, the lip and palate down syndrome, spina bifida abdomen and thoracic. So what I would totally highlight today is the abdominal and thoracic part because the others are not in my purview and Dr. Karmarkar will be speaking on the spina bifida part. Now what are the congenital defects that we come in our day-to-day -day practice? Most of them will be in the thoracic or abdominal like esophageal duodenal, acrylia, leconia mylias, enterexis, omphalocele gastrochysis, dysplastic kidneys, hygromas, sacrococcal keratomas, and benign cysts in the abdomen. So when I tell all the diagnosis, most of the time this diagnosis is not given by the sonologist who is referring the patient. So how do we see these patients coming to the obstetrician or what is the diagnosis with which the child comes to us? Most of the time they will have a in the antenatal scan a cystic structure located in the occipital or cervical region of the fetal neck. So that gives us a clue that it could be a cystic hygroma. This is a picture of a baby who is born with a cystic hygroma. Sometimes in this type of children, we may have to plan an exit therapy depending on what we find in the scan report. If it is pressing on the trachea, if it's a huge one, we think that the delivery of the child is going to be difficult. We form a team wherein we plan for the exit therapy where before the umbilical cord is divided, we intubate the child, uh, deliver the child, make sure that the oxygenation and airway is maintained. If the baby can tolerate without uh, intubation, we can just uh, leave it without intubation. If it is requires an intubation, then we do the surgery, relieve the obstruction. As you can see in this child, the huge cystic hygroma has been operated, the obstruction relieved and then only the child can be extubated. Coming to the other parts of the abdomen, where we get a referral from the obstetrician with the antenatal scan showing that there is normal bowel shadow is not seen. What does it mean? That there may be a esophageal atresia, or there may be a duodenal atresia, or a ileal atresia. How does it manifest is with dilated bowel loops. In a duodenal atresia, you may see the double bubble sign, or in a esophageal atresia, no intestinal gas shadow may be seen because there is a blind ending <coughs> esophagus. Or in an ileal atresia, it may be as a dilated bowel loop. 
So, how do you tackle all these problems when they are referred to you? Then, in the case of esophageal atresia, as we all know, this is a normal anatomy where the normal trachea in the esophagus is seen. In the esophageal atresia, what happens is there is upper end is blind of the esophagus, there is the atretic part, and the lower end of the esophagus may be communicating with the trachea or may not be communicating with the trachea. As we know, there are a lot of varieties of esophageal atresia with tracheal fistula. The most common being the upper end is blind and the lower end is communicating with the trachea. So, what we do in these babies, we optimize them, we stabilize them, and then we join the upper blind ending to the lower end of the trachea doing a esophageal esophageal anastomosis. And if you have a very good setup, the survival rate today is 100 percent. No baby should die of tracheal fistula if managed well. Well, three NICU with a proper pediatric surgical setup. Coming to the other esophageal atresia, other atresia like the duodenal jejunal ileal atresia, they are also referred to us with a antenatal scan of a dilated bowel loop, where the baby is not able to pass meconium after birth. So when we see these babies after birth, we try to do an X-ray, make the diagnosis of a atresia. And then we go ahead with the surgery. So, as you can see, one of the operative pictures wherein one portion of the jejunum is greatly dilated, the other portion is very narrow. So, there are various types of these defects wherein there will be a defect in the mesentery, there may be a blind ending, uh, blind ending jejunum on either side. So, what we do is we always do a end to side anastomosis. So, you can see in this picture there is a hugely dilated proximal jejunum or a duodenum and a very narrow distal duodenum or a jejunum. So, when you match these two intestines, it is very difficult to throw up. So, what you call is an end to side anastomosis. You try to anastomose, give rest and this bowel will start moving after a period of 7 to 10 days. Not like a normal anastomosis, but this takes time, but definitely it moves. So, if you have managed this children, or the new nets at the particular time, at the correct time and the location, then they all do well. So, most of the atresias, like duodenal atresia, jejunal atresia, will do well if properly managed and a proper anastomosis is done. So, these cases, when they come to us and we explain to the parents that these are all correctable anomalies, can be managed in our setup, and then the baby goes home, it's a uh, really good. Uh, Acceptance thing for the parents to accept that the child has got well in spite of such a big anomaly of the jejunal ileal atresia. Now, another um, diagnosis which most often is referred to us is echogenic bowel. The antenatal scan will show echogenic bowel. Echogenic bowel, when it is uh, referred to us, means it can be either a meconium ileus or a giant meconium cyst. We don't know what exactly is happening inside. Even an ultrasound after the birth may not tell us what exactly the thing is, but when we do a laparotomy, sometimes as you can see in this case, is a giant meconium peritonitis, where the bowel has ruptured leading to a cyst which has collected meconium and when you operate, the meconium spills out, then you try to see that most of the bowel has been damaged and whatever healthy bowel, you try to take it out of the stoma. So once you have a very precarious condition like this, where it is infected and you think you cannot do the anastomosis on table, it is always better to do a stoma, temporary stoma, explain the parent that the motion is coming to come out initially through that. Once the child stabilizes, gains weight, then we can go ahead and close that and the child can become normal. But if the child is very lucky, the intestinal continuity is there, it may be just a case of meconium ileus, wherein you just give a gastrography in enema or through the NG tube. Baby passes a big chunk of meconium, which is like a very hard stool. And once the baby passes it, then everything becomes normal. There is no need of operating in such cases where you just need to flush the rectal cavity with a uh, meconium, uh, with a gastrography. The meconium comes out and the baby becomes absolutely normal. So, these are some of the cases of echogenic bowel which may be referred to us and case to case may vary which we can handle it from time to time.
Now the next biggest anomaly which comes to us is anorectal malformation. Most of the time, it may be picked up in the antenatal scan. It may not be picked up in the antenatal scan. As we all know, the male ARN is different from female ARN. In the males, they don't have a uterus and vagina, so the opening is always into the urethra. And there may be low, intermediate, or high variety of anorectal malformations. Whereas in females, also there is the same male, uh, same low, intermediate, and high variety. But always you have a fistula coming out to the fossae or the labia majora. So depending on where the opening is, we try to label them as the type of anomaly. Either we do a colostomy or we do anaplasty. And most of these children will do well. <coughs> the other common anomaly we see in our day-to-day -day practice is diaphragmatic hernia. Most of the antenatal scan will try to see that at the heart level, there will be a bowel shadow seen which normally should not be seen. Most of the time, we will confirm it with a fetal MRI. Fetal MRI will give you a better picture of the diaphragmatic hernia. And after birth, we do an X-ray where we see the bowel moves into the thoracic cavity. Then, depending on the condition of the baby, the most problematic condition in such babies is pulmonary hypertension. If the child has a pulmonary hypertension above suprasystemic pressure, we always intubate, ventilate, and wait till the child becomes normal. It is always a physiological emergency. Diaphragmatic hernia is never a surgical emergency. So we wait for the physiology of the newborn to settle down. Once the pulmonary pressure becomes normal, we take up them, we take them off for surgery. Depending on what is the expertise in that center, either open or a thoracoscopic repair. We do both depending on the condition of the baby. If the pressure is normalized, good birth weight, we try to do a thoracoscopic repair. If the baby is still a little bit higher side on the pulmonary pressure, we do a open repair. So most of the children, they do well. Still in good centers, the survival has come up to 70 to 80% in diaphragmatic hernia. Whereas the international standard is 60 to 70 percent survival, whereas in our center we have a 70 to 80 percent survival, almost more than the international level. Now, other anomaly which may be referred first is a, a abdominal wall defect. As we know, abdominal wall defect can be a umbilical hernia or a ophthalocele, a gastrochysis or a bladder exposure. So when such children are referred to us, we try to optimize them in the NICU. As we know, gastrochysis is a herniation of the bowel loop or the side of the umbilical cord, whereas the omphalocele will be within a sac. So these two differentiation makes us a little bit more confident about managing these babies. And when we try to reduce them primarily and close the defect, most of them do well. But if they have bigger defect, we try to put them in a silo. And ultimately, over a period of time, these children, or they all do well. The other common anomaly which we see is hydronephrosis or cystic kidneys. So when most of the children, they have a hydronephrotic kidney, the commonest one is pelvic ureteric junction obstruction, where there is a obstruction at the pelvic and the ureteric level. And this is a 100% curable anomaly. We just do a simple operation by doing an Anderson hands pyloplasty. After the baby has grown up to three to four months of age, we do a DTPA scan, see the function of the kidney, the AP diameter on the renal pelvis on the ultrasound. If they are preserved, we wait till one year. If they are increasing in size, the kidney is getting uh, affected, then we try to do them earlier. But most of these kidney defects are treatable and they are 100%. The other defect which we commonly see is abdominal cyst. Most of them in females will be an ovarian cyst which we try to locate with a laparoscopy, deflate the cyst and try to bring it out, try to preserve the ovary as far as possible. But if it is a totally totted ovary which is detached from itself, then we have to remove it. Otherwise, it becomes a source of infection. Sometimes we see a mesenteric cyst, a huge mesenteric cyst, which may not be tackled initially in the newborn period. But if it gives problem later on, we try to tackle this mesenteric cyst by doing a laparoscopic mesenteric resection anastomosis. And almost everybody who has this problem is, uh, is curable and 100% of them do well. It is not a problem to be 
terminated if you detect a abdominal cyst in the antenatal scan. So I would like to conclude my talk by saying that which are referred to the pediatric surgeons are treatable and they don't need to be terminated. It is always better to involve the pediatric surgeons during a counseling session so that we can give them the correct perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, you have very clearly uh, given us a conclusion as to uh, the decision making. So, uh, what is the uh, role of the timing of presentation to you? Uh, if the child uh, comes to you, I mean, if the mother comes to you when she has conceived and they, uh, they know about the um, anomaly, uh, how does it help you in planning and uh, the family also? It, how does that uh, affect the prognosis in the later on? See, if uh, we are seeing them in the second trimester, when uh, the 20 week period is over, most of the di diagnosis will be done after that only. So when we come into the picture, the termination uh, chances are very less. If it is a correctable anomaly, we give them a reassurance that it is 100% curable or at least it is curable and we give them a reassurance saying that this child can be cured after the surgery and we will take care of the child once it is born. So it is always better to counsel them and reassure them about the chances of curing and what will be the effect after the delivery of the child. But having said that, some of the children like diaphragmatic hernia, if you see after birth and their pulmonary hypertension is very high, then we have to wait and watch till the pulmonary hypertension settles down, then we can do the surgery. But most of them do well and if we are counseling them after the second trimester, we give them a good prognosis all the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will go on to our next talk by Dr. Santosh Karnakar now. He is going to talk about the important issues regarding birth defect and focus mainly on neural tube defects. Over to you, sir. Can and we have the slide on Dr. Karnakar? I will introduce uh, Mr. Gopi. So, Dr. Kamathar is our uh, national chief of the Spina Bifida Foundation. He, he was the honorary secretary of the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons from 2000 to 2001. He is a senior consultant pediatric surgeon, Department of Pediatric Surgery at the Leelawati Hospital Research Center, Mumbai. He was a uh, uh, formerly associate professor and unit in charge of the Jerabai Wadia Children's Hospital in Mumbai and a presently recognized teacher for PG training for pediatric surgery of the National Board of Examination. He is a visiting fellowship, he had visiting fellowship and professorship in pediatric urology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, USA, also in Liverpool, Alderay Hospitals, UK, King George Hospital, London. He was a visiting professor at the Gaslini Children's Hospital in Italy and a business council DFID visiting professor of UK. He has had a lot of CME lectures to his credit and is a faculty in the national and international meetings. He has conducted many live operative pediatric surgical workshops in various parts of the country. He is a prolific writer and he has more than 35 scientific publications in leading international and national journals. Over to you, sir, for the next talk. Thank you, Prakash. Let me start. Just a moment for the slides to come up. Okay. Uh, uh, are the slides seen well? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Uh, good morning, friends. At the outset, let me welcome all of you officially on behalf of this Pinafira Foundation. Uh, I hope all of you are well, safe, and probably 
have had your first jab of the COVID vaccine. Uh, friends, had it not been for the pandemic, we would have probably had this meeting webinar, not webinar, but a physical meeting last year in 2020. And uh, thanks to Pfizer, the Spina Bifida Foundation had actually planned a series of uh, such meetings on birth defects throughout the country for 2020. And then since March last year, we have been in the throes of this once in a lifetime pandemic. And here we are today, one year later, meeting with all of you online. We have all realized the various advantages of online meetings, but I am all getting a bit fatigued with all these web meetings, and we would soon like to meet all of you in person. After the, uh, the very nice uh, talks and lectures by Dr. Nirmala and Dr. Prakash, what I would be doing over the next 15, 20 minutes is probably focusing on giving you a little bit of more insight into neural tube defects, which has been a passion of mine ever since I was a resident in pediatric surgery. And, and thankfully, this engagement with major birth defect continues. Uh, 3rd of March every year happens to be birth defects day. And the Spina Bifida Foundation of India also has been for the past several years uh, planning activities to sensitize the public, to sensitize authorities, to sensitize central government, state government on the need to look into birth defects, their prevention. So, so 3rd of March is round the corner and I would encourage all of you to undertake some activities in your own local areas and local places to uh, make the people aware of the various birth defects and what one can do towards their prevention. Today's CME is also probably an effort in that direction. Neural tube defects are essentially divided into two parts. One is about 40 to 50 percent of them are anencephaly, which all of you have seen, all of you know of, and the remaining half are the spina bifida or the cerebrospinal dysraphisms, which are, of course, more common. As we talk of defects, especially birth defects like neural tube defects, a lot of work is going to happen to this child with a neural tube defect depending on our outlook, our approach to this anomaly right from the time it may be sent and perinatally and later on in life. It depends on how pessimistic optimistic you are going to be with your approach in dealing with a child with a birth defect and certainly with a serious birth defect like spina bifida. So anencephaly, as we know, is incompatible with life. And one can take a, and, and of course, uh, most of you would say, well, do not continue and can be, and understandably be, uh, you know, not very upbeat about it. But here is a family from the U.S. where they had a child diagnosed with anencephaly, a fetus, but they felt, no, they want to to. Uh, this uh, fetus further delivered the anencephalic child and they, know, they knew that this baby is not going to survive for more than two or three days. But the parent said, even if it's three days, we want to spend 
three happy days with this baby of ours. And they took this happy picture in the hospital with the anencephalic child. This is just to tell you that what happens to a child with a neural tube defect or with is going to depend largely on what is our approach as pediatric surgeons and as all types of specialists who will deal with this problem. So here is the other of neural tube defects and that is a large bubble on the back and looking at the size of this, uh, uh, this lesion, which was picked up antenatally, one would say, oh, it's big, probably is going to have a lot of neurological deficit. And antenatally, I know it's very difficult to predict the outcome. So we will not stick our necks out and say that this child will do well. You have to give a very balanced uh, 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 advice to the family. But in this case, I did st stick my neck out because I saw that the entire lesion was totally cystic. And thankfully, postnatally, there was only a large meningocele and it had no neurological deficit. This is again to highlight that antenatally also, there are, uh, you have to look at these things very carefully. But as I said, maybe 20 years ago, I would not have stuck my neck out and I would have said it's a serious problem and this, these may be the consequences. What affects today in India are a leading cause of neonatal and infant mortality. And as the other common causes of these mortalities, namely neonatal sepsis, prematurity, are largely dealt with, birth defects are becoming a bigger proportion of the causes that cause neonatal infant mortality. And therefore, it is important that we pay more attention to birth defects. And this is certainly realized by the WHO in Southeast Asia, where the incidence of birth defects is very, very high as compared to the other parts of the world. And the WHO is now uh, focusing increasingly on birth defects prevention in our part of the world since the last six to seven years. All of us would imagine birth defects like neural tube defects are also important because unless they are adequately treated, adequately cared for, and adequately rehabilitated, they can lead to a lot of social and economic consequences. Poor quality of life, lifelong impairment, social stigma, still very common with children having spina bifida and some degree of paralysis, paraplegia, very common in India still. Economic burden to the family, to society, to the country is understandable when you have a child born with childhood paralysis. And unfortunately, in a health system such as ours, where, you know, it's overwhelmingly privatized, 70-80% of care is by private sector. So, so in, in a birth defect child with spina bifida, raising these children can be extremely difficult, especially when, as I said, we have very little from the state. And therefore, as doctors, we not only have to be very good medical doctors, but also when you look at a bird defect, you also need to be a 20%-30% medical social worker. There is no uh, fun in just closing the bag in a child with spina bifida. If you cannot see this child and rehabilitate this child, 
completely and see that this child goes to school, goes to college, and becomes a productive individual. So the responsibility when we talk of birth defects as a surgeon is not only to do the operation to a very well and in a timely and prompt manner, but also to follow these children with such birth defects throughout their childhood and certainly into adolescence, at least, if not into their adulthood. Um, other in, in, interesting aspect when we talk of birth defects, and I thought I should include this because many times we don't realize that ethical issues, religious issues, cultural issues uh, define a lot of things that a lot of approaches towards birth defects. Um, you probably may know that in the Netherlands, there is a Groningen protocol. Physicians, obstetricians or pediatricians are allowed to actively terminate the life of an infant born with a neural tube defect. So, so uh, these kind of ethical, medical, legal issues are also uh, matter a lot when looking at uh, birth defects. Uh, friends, Netherlands is a rather interesting country. I mean, I, I can't imagine a place where ethically and morally you are happy to allow a child to be actively, uh, you know, uh, euthanasia to be done. And recently, just I think about two years back, the Groningen Protocol in Netherlands was not only for active euthanasia in infancy, but also to children up to the age of six years. So you can imagine a place where where they are looking at these things uh, rather differently. And of course, there is a there is a big lobby in the world who talks of who is anti this kind of protocol. At the same time, Australia has also gone the Netherlands way and is thinking of euthanasia being allowed for for these conditions. Thankfully. In India, we do not believe in this, and we don't have active euthanasia. However, as a pediatric surgeon, having seen birth defects from the best of elite centers in Mumbai and in rural and smaller places across Maharashtra, I feel passive euthanasia is is quite rampant. It is not legal, but a lot of children with birth defects are very quietly taken home by their families and denied proper medical treatment. We go to the aspects that, that can be discussed when we talk of these issues. But a few years back, I was uh, uh, in Aurangabad to do a tracheoesophageal fistula case. And we did one child who was a boy. And the same evening, there was another child who was a, a girl child with tracheoesophageal fistula. The family of the girl child was very affluent, a businessman family. But they decided not to go ahead for treating this uh, girl child with an anomaly which is completely curable, unlike a neural tube defect where some degree of physical challenges may remain. So these are aspects of birth defects that also we should keep our eyes open to. Many, many girl ch children, girls with birth defects are called, especially if it's a third girl child, with the spina bifida, then in, in Maharashtra, and then, now I know 
in many parts of the world, uh, many parts of India, these girls are called officially named as Nakoshi, which means unwanted. And there is a picture of all these girls whose official names are unwanted. That means Nakoshi in Marathi means unwanted. And the uh, official function was organized by the Maharashtra government to rename all these girls to different names. So we are, we are still at uh, these these problems uh, quite quite uh, wrongly in many parts of the country, but neural tube defect, whatever the size and shape and severity, need not have a have a dismal outcome, and if are done on time, treated on time, these children go on to become productive and at times more productive than some of us and here are some of our patients you see this boy recently received a, 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 a award from the hands of our chief minister because he's a gold medalist swimmer he can't walk without support he maybe at times needs a wheelchair but he's a gold medalist swimmer and so is this girl from a suburb of Mumbai, who is a spina bifida girl, walks with support, has bladder bowel incontinence, but a fantastic swimmer and is in college. This person, a spina bifida individual, is from Rajasthan and is a leading RJ, a radio jockey in Rajasthan. Well, is a spina bifida individual getting married soon and has gone through various surgeries for her back, for her bladder bowel incontinence. Another girl with spina bifida incontinence and perfectly physically active and fit. So all depends on how we look at this issue, what we do to their management, and how we follow them up for rehabilitation. A classic example of how productive a, a person with SB can be is Margot Whiteford, who is the president of our International Federation. Margot is born, was born with spina bifida and she is a pediatric geneticist in Glasgow and one of the most stylish individuals I've met, every uh, uh, clothes that she stitches, she makes a matching wheelchair cover. So it all depends on how you look at these things. The silver lining for a spina bifida is that the brain and the mind will be completely normal in almost all these patients if they get treatment, proper treatment in time. Okay, that let me come to a very important aspect that is how many of neural tube defects are there in India? How many are born with NTDs in it? A very, very credible classic study was published in the Journal of Birth Defects from a group from Pune University and Cambridge. And they made an estimate based on various publications, a meta-analysis, and said that the incidence should, will be at least 4.1 per thousand. And that means that the problem of neural defects is still a big problem in India and folic acid we all know prevents, but we are still not a success story for prevention as Dr. Nirmala was mentioning that folic acid is a success story, but uh, unfortunately we are far behind the world and most women are not aware of taking folic acid preconceptional. 
so the incidence of neural tube defects on a conservative estimate is still more than four times what it should ideally be. Ideally, across the world, an incidence of less than one per thousand would be acceptable. Now, here is some data from various states in India, and this is collected from many sources. You may find the slide is a little faint. That's why I've marked these two arrows because they mention the incidence in Tamil Nadu, which is 47 per 10,000 live births. So that comes to about 4.7 per, per thousand live births, which is again an extremely high incidence. Towards the right hand side of this line, you will see the states of Haryana and Karnataka, where the incidence as per uh, data published in literature some time ago is even higher. And the lowest incidence is on the left hand side of the slide. You see Assam, where it is 0.5. So, so it's quite acceptable. And I wonder why the incidence is less in Northeast India. One can imagine why it's high in the um, western region of India, in Rajasthan, Haryana. Hot climate and deserts are known to give rise to more bird defects. But I don't know why northeast it should be less. Um, so somebody was mentioning whether it has something to do with folic acid in tea. But, but that is not so. Uh, and when you want to make the people and public realize the gravity of the situation, it is good to compare spina bifida with polio. So today, if I say there are 50 cases of polio in India, I think everybody's eyes will open up widely. It will get top coverage in the front papers of all newspapers and Maybe a few health ministers will have to answer questions. Neural tube defect, we are seeing, saying more than 25,000 per year with paralysis, which is worse than polio. And who talks about its prevention? Nobody. So I think we need to address this problem at the national level much, much more seriously. And we a potential of preventing more than 25,000 children born with childhood paralysis. And interestingly, folic acid is also known to prevent cases of cleft lip palate. So an additional outcome of folic acid periconceptional would be that some cases of cleft lip palate may also get prevented. There is a research going on in this matter uh, across the world about its folic acid and its role in cleft lip palate. Um, medical termination of pregnancy, some people consider as secondary prevention of neural tube defect, and I think that is wrong. There can be prevention when you prevent a fetus from having neural tube defect, and MTP is not prevention. I think it's ethically and morally wrong to consider abortion as having prevented a birth defect. What is this neural tube defects? Well, we all know folic acid and being in climates where the climate is hot. It is known that birth defects, but especially neural tube defects, can have a higher incidence. And that is why for pregnant women in Europe, they are strictly advised not to have hot tub baths during the first trimester of pregnancy. And um, then, of course, Dr. Nirmala alluded to anticonvulsants, 
and their role in uh, in, in, in neurative defects. Interestingly, there have been papers uh, relating the intake of blighted potatoes, potatoes which are a little decayed and spoiled. And if you, if the women ate them, then they feel there is a higher incidence of neural tube defect. But apart from all these, we all know that maternal factors such as folic acid intake and B12 are very important to prevent neural tube defects. And I was listening to the discussion on B12 and it is, there are now research papers coming out of uh, a lot of them from London talking about the synergistic effect of B12 in preventing uh, neural tube defect. So if you take folic acid alone, up to 70% of neural tube defects may be prevented. But if a woman took folic acid with B12, then up to 85% of neural tube defects could be prevented. So folate B12 does play a synergistic role in prevention of neural tube defects along with folic acid. Um, I will not go into the details on, of when this uh, folic acid needs to be consumed. Dr. Nirmala has mentioned uh, quite well about the need to take folic acid starting from a few months before pregnancy and into pregnancy. Folic acid supplementation, lot of times, you know, in live meetings, the audience asks a question, but why can't we eat all these foods which are rich with folic acid? Vitamin supplements. Well, the answer to them is that if you had to in, intake equivalent of 400 microgram of folic acid, then people have found out that to get this much amount, you will probably need to have 17 and a half cups of orange juice or 44 and a half medium ripe tomatoes or 200 medium red apples, or 19 cups of raw green beans, etc., etc. So I always wonder then how can it be that in nature there is not one good food source which will give me 400 micrograms of folic acid by just consuming one of that fruit or a small amount of that vegetable. And this is a, this is a, a, there is scope for researching in this. And recently in international meeting where we, uh, we have formed a group for encouraging fortification in India, I learned that there are, uh, there are research papers uh, pub being published in the last few years, which talk of drumstick leaves, moringa or drumstick leaves being a very uh, good source of folic acid and giving adequate intake of folic acid by just consuming um, just normal amounts that you would require to consume in one's daily diet. I don't, there is a paper which I've written in this slide lower down. If you want, you can check it up. But this is something uh, interesting, the role of drumstick. We all know drumsticks, but the source is not the drumsticks, but the leaves of the drumstick plant and the tree. And this is something, some food for thought, as I may say. But even if you took periconceptional folic acid, ensuring adequate levels of folates in all would-be mothers is very difficult because many pregnancies are unplanned. So if your pregnancy is not planned, 
how can you take periconceptional folic acid? And that is why all across the world today there is a increasing talk about food fortification. In many countries, in America, in Europe, it is legally mandatory to fortify all types of flour, all types of food, such biscuits and cakes and whatnot with certain recommended levels of folic acid. And this is essentially to prevent the incidence of neural tube defect. And that is why after fortification in many of these countries, the incidence which was above 2 per thousand has come to 0.7 per thousand. So even in India, there is an effort for fortifying food with folic acid. But the biggest hurdle is that there is, except for tea, coffee, sugar and salt, there is nothing else that our person consumes in a branded banner. We make our wheat flour at home, we make our all other flour, I mean we buy the grain and we get it ground in the local chakkis. But there is an effort now to try and fortify salt and try and fortify maybe tea with folic acid. So these are some things on the horizon which may happen. And fortification of salt with folic acid may be the next big story like salt and iodine which we all know. For every rupee that we spend on prevention, we are saving 38 to 40 rupees on of money for which may be required for treatment. So prevention of spina bifida is also a great cost effective measure as far as governments are concerned. The more affluent and rich the country, the more cost effective prevention is. In United States, for every dollar spent on prevention, you are saving $48 of treatment money. I'm not going to talk too much of anomaly scan. Uh, Dr. Nirmala has spoken about it. Dr. Suresh, I'm sure, is going to talk about it. So we'll go on further. I only want to say that today we have a scan centers all over the country. Even in Taluka places in Maharashtra, we have ultrasound machines and sonologists. But then whether we do that anomaly scan properly, how much time do we spend doing the scan is also very important to accurately diagnose every patient of neural tube defects. So again, let me not go into detail. These are three pictures which, can, which are connected to neural tube defect. Here is a lemon for the lemon sign in ultrasound, a banana for the banana sign, and spinach, which is folic acid. So in my physical lectures in a live audience, I like to put this slide and ask them how these are connected to neural tube defects. And well, there are all kinds of interesting answers when this slide is put on. But so there are some disadvantages of an online meeting. I can't ask live questions to the participants. But anyway, so this is the lemon sign. And again, we all imitate the West. So this is actually, Indian lemons don't look like this. They look more round and circular. But this is the diagnostic sign for a spina bifida lower down. Similarly, the banana sign of the compressed cerebellum is also diagnostic of an open neural tube defect below. So sometimes the skull can tell you more about the spine. 
if you diagnose a neural tube defect antenatally, then today in many developed parts of the world, fetal surgery is the is a viable clinical option. And the father of fetal surgery was this uh, Professor Harrison from California who published this landmark book way back in 1971 and uh, in the in not 71 in the 1990s and um, we have come a long way and fetal surgery is, is now a well accepted modality for treating birth defects and certainly for treating meningomyelocele in many parts of the world and this 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 was established by a double blinded uh, randomized control trial called the mom's trial which was done in the united states and we don't have time to go into detail but as i was mentioning fetal surgery is now an established clinical option it reduces the incidence of hydrocephalus significantly it reverses the Arnold theory malformation and they now know that many of these babies will have better neurological outcomes postnatally as these child children grow up. 2019 December, I was in Katowice, which is the leading center in Europe for fetal surgery and this lady here, Agnieszka, is a fetal surgeon and does the maximum number of fetal surgeries in Europe. She is the first lady fetal surgeon. So we were there to try and establish a collaboration for fetal surgery between her center and Lilawati Hospital. And then, of course, the pandemic threw things totally out of gear, but I hope to start this uh, collaboration soon. As obstetricians, you may like to see these pictures. Here is the uterus which is delivered. Then the placenta is very carefully mapped by an intra-op ultrasound and then staying away from the placenta, a hysterotomy is made. And in Katowice, they use a laser to do the hysterotomy to decrease the amount of bleeding. And then with clamps again, the uh, uterus is opened adequately enough so that the fetus is back and be delivered. And here is the bubble of the meningo seal, meningo milo seal, which has been delivered through the hysterotomy. And then the pediatric surgeon takes over and does the release of the Benningomyelocele like he or she would do after birth. So it is a surgery which is eminently doable. It does not require additional sophisticated equipment, investment and as obstetricians and pediatric surgeons, we need to collaborate in many of our leading centers and, and start doing some of these fetal surgeries, which are now an established clinical option for some birth defects. But then, um, if we have diagnosed a fetal a neural tube defect and then we carry it to term, that's, of course, a decision taken jointly with parents uh, and they are born. We cannot cure a spina bifida. We cannot cure a child who has spina bifida and make his paralyzed limbs moving again. But as I said, the silver lining is their wonderful brains. And so it is our responsibility to do all the things that are required to be done to make their lives productive and much easier. 
here is a list of things that we do and we don't want to go into details of all of them because that will be a separate lecture by itself. But we treat the back, we treat the hydrocephalus, we treat their feet, we do continence management. And of course, we can't forget their rehabilitation. Uh, we do a lot of um, continence work at my center and I get patients of neural tube defects coming from all parts of India, some parts of Africa, of course, our neighboring countries, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan. We had a, a Zoom meeting two days back to encourage them to do these surgeries. And with these uh, incontinent surgeries, we can make them completely socially continent. A few invisible stomas on their abdomen from which they will put catheters and drain their urine from time to time or give enemas to wash out their bowels so that they are socially completely continent like anybody else. Towards the end of this talk, let me just say that all this is possible because of the foundation that we began some years ago and it is only through the reach that the foundation provides that we can we can reach out to many, many more individuals and help them to enhance their lives. And the foundation now has chapters in about 14 states and we do a lot of support work to uh, persons with spina bifida and their families. But it's a long way to reach out to all of them. India is a vast country and when we say 14 states, not enough. Each state, there are hundreds of these children. Here is a girl who was in Kutch and she was almost 15 years old. No treatment given for her spina bifida. The back lesion was scarred. She could not walk. She was incontinent. And we arranged for her to come to Lilavati Hospital and tried our best to operate on all, all these problems that she had. National helpline and you may want to contact us for any kind of help. These are actual pictures of patients who reached us through our helpline in the last five, six months. They are from Gujarat, Andaman, Goa, Meghalaya, Haryana, all over, all over the country. So please feel free to contact us for any help that a spina bifida child or family may require. And if we follow them up, they all go to normal schools as they should go. They go to college then and they will work. Many of our uh, children are now into jobs. And we showed this slide earlier. Here is one of our uh, star uh, members of the foundation. She resides in Chennai and works in a software firm, a leading multinational. And she recently gave birth to a young daughter who, who is completely normal. So this lady is, is a source of inspiration. She is on our core group to inspire others that in spite of spina bifida, you can lead productive lives. You can marry, you can give birth to normal children. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir. That was very enlightening. Uh, if you could quickly take a few questions, there are a few questions for you. Uh, Dr. Yamuna wants to know if there is any research going on with gene therapy to prevent genetic transformation or uh, for neural tube defects. Well, there, there is no clear-cut genetic association with neural tube defects. But there have been some polymorphisms and some anomalies in which uh, it is known that there is a higher incidence of neural tube defects. But, but there's no one 
malformation or one chromosomal or genetic uh, aberration that you know is 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 uh, screened for in every family before uh, you know uh, for neural tube defects uh, i don't know whether dr suresh will have want to add something to this i think uh, gene therapy now is at a very 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 infant stage even though laboratory wise they have uh, identified uh, certain things which can be done but to use it as a routine basis still a long way to go yeah thank you sir uh, also dr tara wants to know what was the incidence of which you detected around actual diet uh the folic acid so uh in in other parts of the world where the awareness for taking folic acid preconceptional is quite widespread such as in the US in some countries in Europe the incidence which was more than 2 per 1000 is now down to less than 1 so it is reduced by more than 50% and which is in the acceptable range as i said folic acid will prevent up to 70% of cases of neural tube defects folic acid will not prevent 100% so the incidence has come down after folic acid widespread folic acid supplementation awareness and to give you another interesting example there was a study from south china some years back and you know those were the times i think this was 15 18 years back when in china before a couple became pregnant they had to take the municipal commissioner's permission so it is a weird country and there they could enforce that all couples uh, all women took folic acid before conception and there the incidence was more than 4 in that south china province which came to about 1.1 after the mandatory folic acid supplementation thank you sir so now due to lack of time we'll move on to our next speaker dr suresh he is going to talk about the birth defects registry in india i have to introduce dr suresh and uh, he is actually the director of medical medicine and system chennai who everybody knows is quite a famous scan center in chennai and they have many multiple branches in india he is the honorary secretary of the voluntary health services and he has a fetal medicine as a fetal medicine specialist he is uh, doing ultrasound for the last 38 years only specialized on fetal medicine he was conferred the frcog by the royal college of london in 2010 he is established as a specialized twin unit with facilities for fetoscopy and laser for monoclonal twins he does lot of intervention in his scan center as well His main areas of interest are prenatal diagnosis and fetal therapy. He is working closely with NRHM and Tamil Nadu government to train doctors at PACs in basic obstetric ultrasound for reduction of birth defects. He is a former member of the WHO CRO expert group for birth defects surveillance and prevention. He has trained over 5,000 doctors from India and other countries in ultrasound and fetal medicine. is a managing trustee of the fetal care research foundation chennai and icog task force member and a deputy thank you sir thank you very much please the next team is yours thank you sir uh, my my audible am i audible yes yes yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes thank yes. you Thank you, sir, for this uh, kind words of introduction, and thank you for inviting me today. <clears throat> I'm going to quickly uh, run through uh, the process of establishing a birth defect surveillance system, and also find out what is the need. Uh, Fetal Care Research Foundation was established in the year 
to have preventive, supportive, and curative uh, uh, focus on birth defects. And because we found several parents who had defective children were asking several questions. One of the questions was, will this, will this come back again? And what can I do for the child with a uh, defect which is already born? So if you look at congenital uh, anomalies, we need to really differentiate between congenital malformations, which is defect in embryogenesis resulting in structural defects, and congenital anomalies, which form a diverse group of structural or functional abnormalities including metabolic disorders which are prenatal in origin. Now, one of the important things is uh, about 40 to 60 percent of birth defects, we really don't know the cause. So we just need to identify them and then uh, manage them in, in an appropriate fashion. About a quarter of them, you have multifactorial inheritance, uh, so multiple causes. Then you have a small number of chromosomal and other, other defects. But the most important thing is over 90% of lethal defects are identified prenatally, and we are trying to identify them earlier and earlier in the pregnancy. 60 to 70% detected by 12 to 13 weeks, and overall detection rate was 70%, which means around 20 to 30% defects will still be undetected antenatally, and you have to deal with them at birth. Now, this paper, which is a... Uh, uh, we looked at birth defect mortality in India between 1990 and 2017, uh, showed that uh, this was published in October 2020, and said the national birth prevalence of congenital anomalies is 184.48 per 10,000 births, which is pretty high. And birth defects in India in 2017 caused 37,000 uh, deaths in the early neonatal period and 27,000 deaths in the post-neonatal period which is five times as high uh, as that of high-income countries, and double uh, this was double that of high-income countries. Now, major congenital af uh, anomalies affected one in 44 pregnancies and 589,000 affected births in India each year. And this data came from the R RBSK data in 2013. So the concern of birth defects is uh, lethal. We have lethal defects which causes early neonatal death, or sometimes it has uh, have miscarriage, non-lethal defects, which have short or long-term morbidity, the costs of managing the abnormality, and also the contribution to the national disease burden, because it's a huge strain on the system where there's prolonged hospitalization, and then many places, supportive care is not, uh, not available up to the mark, so these children have significant disability. Uh, and also there's a loss of productivity of one family member uh, who needs to be a caregiver for a child with severe disorders. Uh, so the need is to identify defects early, uh, also a continuous tracking of defects with periodic modification of public health policy to change, which needs to change with the needs of the situation. The solution is to establish a strong and robust surveillance system throughout the country. Now, uh, so we need the birth defect registry to understand prevalence and geographic distribution, also to plan primary prevention, to know the effectiveness of our primary prevention. By giving folic acid, there was a question whether it is actually reduced or no. We can, by because we are able to do early ultrasound, we can actually look at primary prevention with folic acid. Or also plan resources for management, and plan strategies for early intervention, correction, and supporting poor quality of life. Now, what are the types of registries that can be done? One is called as a population-based registry, where we take data from a geographically defined population and aim to register all cases of the population. Now, this can be as small an area as within a city, like Mumbai city or Chennai city. It could be within that area, or it could be within a state, or it could be within a region. But you need to define the population and say, I will collect data only from these patients who come from within this uh, particular area. You can even say within a five mile radius or a 10 mile radius of the place where you're sitting in. The other thing, of course, is a non-population based registry based on clinical centers and other uh, criteria. That is members of a patient uh, um, organization, for example, 
organizations of rare disease india or spina bifida foundation uh, you can look at uh, a very disease specific registry you can go and register only patients with spina bifida to have a great answer we have done like that for a uh, lysosomal storage disorders and uh, mucopolysaccharidosis so on and so forth and uh, here the population coverage will not be very comprehensive but it is for serve a very specific purpose for that group now they have different uses but both are useful provided they serve the target uh, aims the population based registry are three types one is called as the active registry where the surveillance personnel abstract data from data sources including direct visualization so if there is a defect there's a there's a person who goes and visits looks at the baby documents everything or goes to a hospital records and then go if, if there's been a, a good documentation of the anomalies you take data from there and do so this is an active reporting the second is passive reporting where the registry personnel the surveillance program uh, is is at one location and people just report uh, all the persons wherever from various geographical locations there's a report into the registry by just filling out a form now there's a hybrid model which is a combination of both passive and active reporting systems where there's active case at ascertainment by trained personnel and also close follow by the registry now throughout the world they have uh, they have uh, said that doing a complete active registry is going to be extremely difficult uh, completely passive also may not be very optimal a hybrid model may probably be the most optimal method the birth defect registry of india so far was it just started in 2001 we just looked at initially we wanted to gain traction and motivate people to at least start reporting defects so we started a voluntary passive reporting of birth defect except in chennai where we will go and visit and try to get data the, the fetus will be brought to us for autopsy where we can get more information we enrolled almost 635 hospitals across india and over 16 lakh defects were covered over a period of 11 years now uh, in the main mission was uh, to ascertain nationwide prevalence of birth defects a very tall objective because the number of people compared to the total number of births happening in india 25 million births whatever we took was a very very small sample and not not, not enough to go and Uh, extrapolate and predict uh, objectives are to establish bdrs throughout india uh, to monitor secular trends and clustering uh, provide guidelines and assistance to upcoming centers for uniform methods of data collection collect analyze and disseminate per defect surveillance data the second phase was to reduce the incident to form support groups ntd down syndrome lsd and today we know for uh, lsd we have a very strong support group for down syndrome there is an extremely sub- strong support group working across india and of course ntd support group is uh, is available uh, by the sps pena bifida foundation now uh, ob- the objectives to do preventive and supportive strategies to create awareness by educating the public regarding birth defects and and the formation of support groups for various other disorders which could be more prevalent now when you talk about a registry <clears throat> we know that in india more than half of the deliveries happen in the government sector and half of them in the private sector in some places more than 70 70% 70% uh, occur in the government sector so it's very important that the government sector and private sector have to team up to make the registry workable now this registry was there was no membership fee we had uh, some government institutions and uh, a number of private institutions participating so we had a central registry uh, in each region we made one hospital as the bdr coordinator we call them as the nodal center and then we had participating uh, members so the part the nodal uh, member uh, is responsibility is to go and motivate these people to send the data and these people to will send the data uh, to the central registry so we made it very simple uh, because the first uh, forms which we made ran into several pages and we knew compliance was going to be very poor so we reduced the uh, number of questions that need to be asked to very simple few questions and form a 
was we needed to know the live births, uh, IUD and stillbirths, and MTP following anomaly. This formed our denominator. So that, that was quite important to calculate uh, the prevalence. Then we just put as a, had a form B, uh, which shows uh, the identification details and also some basic demographic details and also details of the anomaly. But uh, WHO in Southeast Asian region came up with a, 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 a standardized form for birth defect surveillance. And this is now available uh, online as a, as a software where uh, you can see the fetus and the neonate, the information about the parents and type of congenital anomaly and also any additional information that was available. Right. So the same thing has been converted online uh, by our team and this uh, has been used for uh, reporting. Of course, WHO has not uh, given the form A, so we have form A separately and the form B separately. Now what happens? Antenatal ultrasound centers, obstetricians, neonatologists, pediatricians, genetic labs, perinatal pathologists could push data into the BDRI where uh, there will be a dysmorphologist who verifies the data. We assign an ICD-10 code, entry into the computer, and then do an epidemiological analysis. And we were regularly producing a quarterly newsletter uh, uh, telling information about what has happened in the last quarter. Now, the Birth Defects Registry of India was enrolled as a recognized member of the International Clearing House for Birth Defects, um, and we periodically give uh, data there. Now, the coverage of births, as you can see, uh, we have uh, completed uh, almost like uh, 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 more than 16 lakh birth defects. But after 2016, there has been reduced patronage and there has been some funding issues. So, uh, but if you look at the proportion of system anomalies, uh, CNS tops the list with almost like 36.2%. And cardiovascular system also almost like 15%, musculoskeletal 15%, and all the others were uh, minor anomalies. So what we needed to know, uh, across all registries, we need, needed to know the crude prevalence of selected system. And you find that across all registries, the CNS anomalies were more, and the, uh, the cardiovascular anomalies were also almost similar, except in Chennai, it was very, very high because of increased detection rate uh, in, in, in Chennai because of very vigorous pursual of uh, the antenatal detection. Right. So we came together and wanted to know what was the top 10, because if we have the top 10 anomalies, then we can go and focus on uh, early diagnosis, uh, if possible prevention, and also early institution of uh, uh, treatment measures. So among the top 10, we found neural tube defects and uh, ventricomegaly, talipus, and uh, cardiac anomalies, uh, abdominal wall defects, and cleft lip and palate. The government has a very efficient system of dealing with cleft lip and palate also because uh, of the Smile Train project. Uh, the government did a house-to-house -house survey for cleft lip and palate, and I will show you uh, the result of that uh, in another, another slide. Now, also, the, the cardiac anomaly today we have in Chennai, uh, excellent cardiac uh, management uh, across the country. Um, uh, neonatal pediatric uh, cardiac surgery is uh, done very well. So a number of these children could be saved. And, of course, the, there were patients who were actually terminating pregnancies for when talipus was diagnosed antenatally. Today, effective counseling means none of them will do the termination. And when we distributed the data across the country, we found uh, the higher incidence uh, of NTD in these areas. Cardiovascular system we found uh, in Rajasthan, cleft lip and palate more uh, in um, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and also limb reduction defects were more in Assam. Of course, these are all small sample data, and we need much larger data to uh, draw any conclusions from that. But if you take NTD, the trend in the prevalence of NTD among all anomalies, you find they seem to be uh, remaining almost similar. It is not, there's been some reduction uh, beyond 2011, uh, but it's been more or less same. So this shows 
we need to really, really concentrate on NTD to make sure the incidence is lower. So we went to the government and told them, look here, we need to set up a system and we are ready to set it up for you. So the government gave us permission to go to one district and uh, we at the, at the PHC and sub-center, we uh, trained about 122 uh, persons, 52 medical officers, 54 staff nurses and 16 ANMs. And out of 56 PHCs, 54 were covered for training. And this was a six month period, February to May 2014. And then uh, <clears throat> we went on till October uh, to collect the data. And then the project report was submitted in December. We made a, a, a sort of an atlas for them to uh, identify the defects. So we gave them a specific protocol when the baby is born, if it was alive, to examine head to foot, document normal and abnormal. We told them how to take pictures, notify the medical officer and the BDRI, uh, fill the form. And this was given online, so quickly they could fill the form. And once they identify the, the baby was immediately shifted to the next level center uh, to for uh, treatment. So what happened? In that time, uh, cleft lip and palate, talipus, ambiguigenitalia, anorectal malformation, congenital heart disease, epidermolysis bullosa, syndactyly, and talipus in imperfect anus were, uh, were all identified. And uh, they were referred to a specialist care at Government Children's Hospital in Chennai without wasting time. They were, uh, the parents were prepared, everybody was prepared. The moment the baby was born, the baby was shifted. Only one baby uh, died among all the babies who were born. But uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> of course, this was the online reporting software which I told you about. Uh, we, we gave them, because you could use your mobile phone and then upload the birth defect on the cloud so that the specialist can see um, to, from wherever he is. So we also gave them an atlas for referencing. Uh, of course, they had to get photographic consent from the parents. And uh, the geneticist could view the picture, can verify the diagnosis or ask for more details. So uh, it was a simple data entry. It, flexibility allows through the mobile. Uh, the, it was, uh, the acceptability was uh, low because it was not made mandatory. So one of the lessons we learned is if you want to establish a system, there has to be some governmental uh, uh, push for it to do so that it, the larger picture is um, fulfilled, the larger objectives are fulfilled as we go along. There was under-reporting from PHCs and there was delayed reporting and follow-up was required. But it's a very small time. All this takes time to motivate the people and get them. Uh, we need to create champions in the society who will be participating in this area. Now the World Health Organization, CDC, and also the International Clinic House of Birth Defects have brought out some surveillance kits. So here's a birth defect surveillance manual for program managers and an atlas of selected congenital anomalies. These are resources which we could use when we want to implement because when we implement, if you go according to this protocol, then we certainly can, it can be a standard way it is done. We should also understand the changing scenario. Over 90% of large spina bifida are diagnosed by 12 to 14 weeks. 60 to 70% of defects diagnosed by 12 to 14 weeks. Spina bifida, there are several methods, like direct visualization and many ultrasound methods which are there, which has actually helped us to show that's a significant reduction in the live birth of neural defects in the last few years. And there is an urgent need for a pre dental registry and the birth registry. Because if you are giving folic acid, and if you really want to know whether prevention, primary prevention has occurred, then you need to take the data from the prenatal data where a diagnosis has been made. And you have to take the postnatal data, those who have missed. Those have, so the live birth are the only uh, cases which are missed on the antenatal ultrasound. The actual occurrence means you have to take both the prenatal and the postnatal data. So this is the graph which I want to show you before I, I conclude. Uh, this was a, a paper which showed the birth defect mortality in India between 1990 to 2007, uh, 2017. And various anomalies are there, like congenital heart disease, uh, musculoskeletal, urogenital anomalies, and Down syndrome. The three graphs actually represent 
the number, the mortality, and the overall rate of occurrence. Now let us let us consider cleft lips, uh, oral facial clefts, and neural tube defects alone. We find among all anomalies, oral facial clefts are the only ones which showed a re reduction in the number and also the reduction in their contribution to the overall mortality. If you take neural tube defects, that has the rate is slightly declined. The number, is, yes, declined, but their contribution to overall mortality is still still high. So this shows why did orofacial clefts change so significantly? Because of the enormous amount of push which was given for uh, identifying and managing these defects uh, as quickly as possible. So that's what we need to do for uh, uh, NTD also. So the challenges are uh, we need to go somehow get the government engaged in this process in a very serious fashion. The government has to allocate funds for establishing a national registry so that everybody can pull, pull that data in. Private participation extremely important. At present it's only by motivation. It's not by a sense of responsibility. Making reporting of birth defects, if it becomes mandatory, it will be very good. You create a national task force for birth defects. Evolve strategies for prevention, early diagnosis, intervention and support. Public awareness campaigns. And of course, budget allocation. Link with the RBSK scheme. So, lastly, just always, as I say this, uh, when, uh, when your friend gets engaged, Give them a box of folic acid and vitamin B12 as they are present, so you will help them to uh, help her to uh, prevent a neural tube defect for herself. And we call this as the engagement pill. Now, uh, establishing birth defect registry is a social responsibility. Uh, the World Defe Health Organization has declared World Birth Defects Day on March 3rd, and on March 3rd, we are relaunching our birth defect registry after a few years where it is uh, um, in, a, in a way where we are getting the antenatal and the postnatal registries uh, together. So we request you to help us joining hands with the BDRI and also helping little hands make a big difference. Thank you very much for a patient listening. Thank you, sir. That was a detailed explanation about Uh, we all the talks for the day. Uh, 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 the men about Me, there is something. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, your, uh, connectivity seems to be an issue, so we are not able to break it up. Just can you us? No, no, I think our bandwidth, our bandwidth is low. Okay, can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, yeah, yes. best. You can see the screen also? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We've uh, roughly gone to the... So, uh, we've seen what the disease burden is. It, uh, we have four effects and the uh, burden is uh, uh, nine... And privilege 70 uh, children with birth every, every so the long consequences are quite heavy for the family and for the healthcare systems so the most common defect in India is actually the neural tube defect and 70% uh, of these defects can be prevented if adequate awareness and counseling and screening tests are done so uh, 
the, even now we see that almost 22.8 percent of pregnant women do not have any antenatal check. They come directly for the delivery many a time. And uh, 33 percent of uh, women receive antenatal check only after the fourth month. So the access to medical care is very uh, disproportionate to the whole of India. And uh, even the antenatal screening sensitivity ranges all the way from 8.7 to 85 percent, depending on the centers where they are being done. So we've also gone through the primary prevention uh, in uh, uh, detecting all these uh, anomalies. And uh, what we can do so that uh, we can prevent uh, the anomalies and uh, ultimately uh, give a better life to the children who are affected with these anomalies. So there are, uh, the various de uh, detection methods have also been uh, uh, touched upon, uh, the prenatal and postnatal uh, screening tests. But the thing is, um, the high-risk pregnancies are always uh, uh, taken care of uh, in more uh, greater detail. These screening tests are more aimed at uh, finding the pregnancies which are at the risk, so that we uh, comb through the whole population and bring out the uh, pregnancies which would not have been detected if it was for these uh, screening tests. So the objective is not only as, as a life-saving measure, uh, but also to prevent uh, progression uh, of the physical, intellectual, and visual or auditory disabilities in children with birth defects. Uh, the treatments are various, uh, depending on the kind of uh, defects that, uh, that are established. And uh, there are various methods uh, um, that have been adopted in India by the government of India, like the Micronutrient Initiative, which uh, used for the fortification of flour. But uh, sadly, only about 42.44.5 uh, uh, million Indians use that flour. Even after the universal iodization and uh, double fortification of iodine, uh, which is uh, started much before the fortification with uh, folic acid, only 50% of the population has access to iodized salt. So by the time we increase our aven uh, the awareness about folic acid and the population starts receiving it, it's going to take some time and it's going to be an uphill task. So there are multiple international task forces which uh, are trying to create a registry and uh, survey these uh, uh, birth defects. And uh, in India, uh, the BDRI is uh, qu uh, quite a consistent and uh, effective uh, uh, registry that we have right now. However, since it is a, a passive uh, registry, uh, we have to work forward and uh, uh, tell all the people and increase the awareness so that we can uh, re register them in these registries. So finally, the goal uh, uh, defined by WHO uh, in case of birth defects is to attain the highest attainable standard of health for all women, children, and adolescents to transform the future and to ensure that every newborn mother and child not only survives, but thrives. So that's what we all are going to be working forward to. Now I would uh, like to hand over the uh, stage to Sneha Savan. She is, the uh, she is a professional social worker. Uh, she is the chief coordinator at the Spina Bifida Foundation. She has an education, uh, a master's in social work from SNDT College. And she, before uh, her work with Spina Bifida Foundation, she was working at Dr. ML Dhanale Trust Hospital in Mumbai. So over to you, Sneha Savan. She's going to tell us about the work of the Spina Bifida Foundation. Thank you. Sneha, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Oh. Able to see? Yes. Your slide has yes. slide has started. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I will not take much of your time. As I know, this is your Sunday morning. No, afternoon now. Uh, so, further I will proceed about Spina Bifida Foundation. Okay. Spina Bifida Foundation is a not-for-profit organization which was formed in 2006, but the work of uh, Spina Bifida had 
started early in 1997 where a group of doctor medical professionals and parents uh, of children with spina bifida felt need of uh, of working for uh, a cause for spreading awareness amongst people uh, about the, about the birth defect which is most preventable our mission is to improve the lives and well-being of children and adults with spina bifida aware aware and prevent spina bifida this is like as dr santosh sir has said many women many goal goal child are called nokoshi which is unwanted making change in uh, in their life like making them wanted is our major aim not only uh, girl child all all individuals making their life improve also rehabilitate them for uh, a good a good citizen what we do awareness amongst the mass these are some pictures before lockdown we used to take some cmes uh, awareness sessions uh, on board defect awareness uh, awareness among young young women in women colleges some health talks on uh, board defects this were before lockdown as we know after log uh, lockdown the mode had been changed in person to online so after lockdown uh, we started taking webinars these are our recent recently we uh, took this webinars in women's college on women's health and preventive measures towards birth defect to make sensitize women young women in uh, women's college about the birth defect and women's health this is our first cme with tamil nadu state chapter uh, further we are going to do the series of cmes in uh, in all over india then we did uh, during lockdown we did many webinars out of which one was heart to heart talk uh, between spina bifida individuals uh, she is divya krishnan as dr santosh sir had explained you she she is software engineer she just gave birth to this cute girl uh, and the girl is absolutely fine and she is more inspirational for other Uh, other spina bifida individuals those who are on wheelchair and do not don't do anything potential so there there was a heart to heart to heart talk between her and stuti vora stuti vora is 16 year old teenage uh, she is also wheelchair bound but yet very confident very intelligent girl so uh, few more see a uh, few more webinars which we did internationally webinar on holistic care of spina bifida uh one more a life and the world of spina bifida and hydrocephalus reflection and memories a uh, and global tip for spina bifida prevention and research and one more with uh, spina bifida i had done one uh one webinar uh as we had good collaboration with international so we usually do many uh many webinars many projects with international federation and international we get more support from them this has uh, some more webinars which we did uh here you will see khushi khushi ganatra is uh, a spina bifida individual with wheelchair but uh, she is a, a weight lifter good a uh, inspirational one uh, one more from uh, one more girl good inspirational girl a uh, heart to heart talk uh, this webinar was on heart to heart between spina bifida individual with parth hingre is a swimmer and merlin another webinar on physiotherapy requirements for individual with spina bifida and multidisciplinary webinar we conduct outreach programs this we did uh, at jawhar it is near to uh, mumbai uh, this camp was done in before our lockdown this at lavati 
after after this uh, outreach program, we uh, do a counseling session to make and sensitize people about the uh, about the birth defect. Uh, we also give financial assistance for rehabilitation for medical and scholarships. Recently, we did uh, a, a, a campaign, a fundraising campaign, which was for Kushi's wheelchair. She, uh, we raised up to two lakh fifty thousand for her. And her uh, success. This was successfully done, and uh, her we very few, uh, soon she will get her wheelchair. Maybe by uh, March end she will get her wheelchair. And she is amazing. She is uh, she is a weightlifter. She will this wheelchair will give more empowerment, which will support her for more, and she will make India proud. This is Tabasum. Uh, this we this is ongoing uh, fundraising campaign. Uh, Tabasum is nine year old girl who is facing incontinence urine uh, in urine and uh, stool for urine and stool. She is uh, actually because of uh, this incontinence she is facing urine uh, urine infection and due to this uh, her uh, there is order in her urine, so other children started avoiding her. Uh, other other children don't play with her, don't, don't like to sit beside her in school. Uh, her fa father is daily village worker, and uh, she needs to undergo a super major uh, operation that is augmentation for her rehabilitation for uh, social for her social rehabilitation. Go Foley campaign. Uh, we run a Go Foley campaign. Uh, as uh, as sir had already mentioned, uh, we run this uh, and uh, our actress Ravina Tandon endorsed this. Uh, also, we have a group of international uh, people who are going to sensitize a government to uh, to uh, forty for fortification of. Uh, 45 food products in India. We have cells for China by feeder individuals and family. Uh, so we, some of our experts who does counseling for uh, their families and individuals, psychological counseling, sexual and marital issues, schooling and educational, nutrition and diet and obesity, uh, medical, surgical, Treatment, physiotherapy and orthosis, employment counseling. How can you connect with us? Become a member. Uh, there are some benefits which we give for our members. Uh, worldwide networking with Spina Bifida community. As you know, we have good networking, good uh, collaboration with International Federation. Uh, access to full content on website. There are some contents which are not uh, given access to all that will uh, be only given to our members. Access to newsletter. In every three months, we release our newsletter, uh, which, which we give access only for our uh, members. Special merchandise. merchandise. Uh, there are some merchandise which we give to our members. You can also do internship in our organization. You can volunteer in our organization. Don't for spine donate for our, our cause for our uh, foundation. Giving is not just about making a donation; it is about making a difference. You can make a difference in Tabasum Slice, which is our recent appeal. For more, uh, for more, more donation and for more details, you can visit our site spinabifidafoundation.org. You can connect with us if you have still, uh, if you have doubts or anything regarding any, any of, of during this webinar, you can contact us. You can mail us. You can phone on us. Phone us on this mobile number. Thank you. I, I would like to thank our. Webinar speakers Dr. Nirmala Jayashankar, Dr. Prakash Agarwal, Dr. Santosh Karmarkar, 
Dr. Suresh for taking time for from your busy schedule uh, and making this uh, webinar more knowledgeable uh, and sharing your experience. I will also like to th thank Dr. Tisini Joseph for asking uh, questions of our participants and also uh, summarizing the webinar. I would like to thank all the participants. Without them, this webinar would have not been successful. Thank you all. I would like to thank Pfizer for giving us opportunity to conduct such knowledgeable webinar. Thank you, Gopi sir, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you all. Uh, Gopi, would you like to conclude? Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Neha, for that uh, kind words. But uh, I think uh, uh, the very fact that we had more than 260 people uh, listening right from the beginning of the webinar till the end of it and asking such uh, quality of uh, questions clearly shows the kind of impact this kind of webinar has had. And uh, like uh, Sneha was talking about it, we have committed to Smyrna Wifeda Foundation that we'll go ahead and do uh, these kind of uh, sessions, uh, 11 more with the other foundation, different states which are there so that we reach out this message to all these, uh, uh, all the population, especially gynecologists, which is the area where we actually have a direct mm -hmm. contact with them. So we expect the message, the awareness to reach to as many people as possible. And I hope uh, attendees have gain a different perspective on the importance of uh, uh, prevention of birth defects and that most of it is in your hands, like 70% are actually preventable with simple intervention. So I think that message uh, helps you uh, ensure that our going forward, uh, Dr. Suresh's birth registry will register a dip in the growth of, uh, in the graph of NTDs also, as it has done in the case of uh, cleft lift. So hoping for that and uh, I would only like to assure everybody that uh, Pfizer will be participants and partners in this kind of endeavor going ahead. So this is a commitment from our side. And finally, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Santosh Karmarkar, who has been actually uh, the reason why we have become ourselves aware of the need for this kind of interventions and will allow to associate with this initiative for a long time to come. And to be very honest, uh, it was amazing to have uh, heard from Dr. Nirmala uh, Dr. Prakash and Dr. Suresh uh, and Dr. Tissini. And thank you very much for your time and your uh, uh, effort in uh, this webinar. And I sincerely thank all of you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. So thank you very much. And any final words over to you, Dr. Santosh. No, no, thank you, Gopi. I think uh, in these online webinars, see how many people are there at the beginning and how many yeah, yeah. are there at the end. And as you told me some time back, we started with 175 and at the end there were 250. So I think that uh, that is the criteria to judge our online things. Because you don't have a captive, captive audience in an auditorium. They can just, true. They can just switch off. True. <laughs> true, true. Okay, but I mean, these but, are the registrations before the start, and then as it started off in the first uh, 15 20 minutes, all the rest of them joined in. Yeah, great. And thank you, Gopi and Pfizer, once again for this uh, I mean, this great cause which you are supporting. Without your help, I mean, maybe it's tough to organize many of these things, although online it's become a bit easier, but still, uh, thank you so much. And thank you to all, all faculty, all participants for giving your Sunday morning for, for this session. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you, Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Dr. Tishini, thank you very much for that flawless coordination. Yes. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks, right. Tishini. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We'll call the meeting and Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir.